Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Thank you to Interintellect for having us. This is the third Liberties X Interintellect Salon. Um, we're going to be doing them monthly with one of our writers. And for this salon, we have Rachel Connolly here to talk about her debut novel, Lazy City. Uh, you can pre-order the novel at the link that I sent in the group chat. Um, and Rachel also has an essay that is in the most recent issue of Liberties, which is just, it just went up on our website yesterday. And I've put that link in the chat as well. Um, if you are eager for more of her writing, but we won't be able to get the book until, when is it? When does it come out in the States, Rachel? Of October in the okay. US. Yeah. Okay. So unfortunately for all of you, you will have to wait for it. I got to read it already. But um, but you can read, you can read her Substack and you can also read her her essay in Liberties. Okay. So just to like get things started, um, Rachel, what is this book about? Um, it's a great question. <laughs> Um, it's basically, so I'm from Belfast, um, and the premise of the book, it's set in Belfast, um, and it's basically a kind of young woman in her 20s who has a sort of personal crisis, um, a friend of hers dies, and she kind of moves back to Belfast from where she has been living in London to sort of like try and regroup and make sense of things, and basically kind of, it's sort of just like going and drinking a lot and kind of hanging out with old friends, hooks up with this sort of older man who she kind of thinks she's sort of using, <laughs> might be the other way around. <laughs> and then um, also kind of reconnects with an old flame and it's sort of like her trying to kind of find her way back to normality through these various relationships is the book. Yeah, I think one of, one of the interesting things about the way that you treat grief in the book uh, and you kind of, you kind of, say this outright at one point is that grief grief is a lot harder to consider when it's sort of this like this numbing this ambient numbing rather than like an event that happens or like something catastrophic or cataclysmic that that you the reader gets to experience with the character and mm -hmm. so trying to like explain the normal that a person is supposed to return to after something horrific happens is a lot harder than describing the horror itself uh, mm -hmm. and I wonder like I mean sh the, the the part that I'm thinking about where you kind of get at this explicitly is when she's um when Aaron who is the main character is is talking to her her friend on her birthday like after yes. after her death she remembers or she gets a reminder on her phone which is horrifying the, that it is this girl's this woman's birthday and um she says, I don't want to remember you on like the birthdays or the, or the, the exciting events. I want to remember you as a normal person yes. and it's harder, you know, to, so, I mean, was it, did you set out to do that? Did you like give yourself this task or is there some reason why, um, that was the, yeah. that was the context you chose? Yeah. Grief's always been interesting to me because of, I think because of growing up in Belfast and because there's a lot of a kind of like history of sort of like collective trauma there that is suppressed rather than sort of dealt with and processed and all of the rest of it and I think um there's a lot of just like unspoken stuff that people don't touch and don't talk about because that's been a way of sort of moving on I guess or a way of moving forward perhaps not moving on <laughs> but um I think that's something that's always kind of interested me the idea that instead of having these kind of like big cataclysmic discussions or big sort of like emotive moments that people do sort of just like try and put stuff to one side and try and kind of live their normal life as far as they can and I think that's I guess that's something that I've kind of always been sort of interested in and have sort of always observed and I think um I think I guess I wanted to show grief as it as it manifests in the sense where you can't just sort of put your whole in a, in a book in, a, in another novel you might just put your whole life aside and have this like big breakdown but in real life you can't really do that and I think like with her especially Erin her friend who died is a friend who she knew in London and when she moves back to Belfast there's not actually that many people there who knew this friend and because they had a really close friendship she does kind of suffer with the fact that 
nobody else really had the same relationship they did. And I think I kind of was interested in that dynamic of there's not really anybody who she can actually process this with. And so she's basically like left with this quite strange situation, which is that nobody around her actually feels the same way, really. And nobody kind of, there's not really anyone who she can kind of say like, share memories with or and I think that was quite interesting to me because I think um and on set everybody's kind of doing one thing on the surface and then doing something else <laughs> underneath and that's that's always been super interesting the dynamic to me I think yeah it's it definitely is it it reminds me it's different but um it reminds me of Henry James because in <laughs> Henry James's novels there's so much that like if they would just say it, it would just solve so many problems. Yeah. <laughs> but then the plot wouldn't happen because so much of the plot is just them not being able to say anything. And it is just like, just say it. Like, yeah. but, but she can't. And it's an interesting, okay, so the um, the idea of the purity of language and not wanting to put anything into words that you can't say precisely. And so just like not saying anything yeah. is, is a, like a thing that Erin really struggles with because yeah. she she can't stand it when anybody says something that's not sincere. Um, And I think this is like a really big, it's, it's, it's the, it's the piece of cult. It's the part of her culture that I think is the most oppressive for her. Like it's the thing about her relationship with this American that I think drives her the most insane. And I wonder why it didn't occur to me until just now when you were talking Kate was not from Ireland she wasn't from Belfast so it was so interesting to me that this person who I think is like the only person in her life up until she died or maybe even after she died also that she could be sincere with is not from this the same place that she's from and I wonder if that was something that you did intentionally yeah I think it's um I think an interesting thing with Erin is that she's yeah she has a kind of distance from and I think partly it's because her you know her family life is quite dysfunctional and that leads to a situation where relationships with people for her are quite transactional because she's very mistrustful of other people and it's I mean Declan and her actually have a quite close relationship I would see but most of her other relationships are basically transactional and it's like if once she realizes that she can get something out of someone she does kind of then to de- de- demote them and I think that's actually what, what I see is happening with her and the American she kind of uses him for something practical and then their relationship almost like a shunted down whereas he thinks he, he thinks it's gone the other way you know it's yeah. like he, so like we, I've done you this favor and now we ascend to a different plane but she's like oh no now you become something else yeah. I think that it's interesting to think about her relationship with Kit in that, and I deliberately sort of like tried to leave this ambiguous, but it's sort of interesting to think that where they as close as she remembers them being in that, is it a sort of nostalgia of she, maybe she, maybe it was exactly the same type of relationship as she always has, or maybe that was the best relationship ever, <laughs> or is it? <laughs> It's, it's or, or is it the case that it was someone who kind of because I think with Aaron there's a bit of like having to just accept that and Declan is good at doing this too that there's a kind of like level with her that you probably won't ever get to or won't feel like you're getting to and I think that um there's a bit I think in the in the um, chapter where where she kind of goes to get stuff from her mom's house there's a kind of bit there where she kind of goes through the relationship with Kate in terms of Kate was good at listening to things and not providing that kind of response which really freaked her out you know that kind of Kate was good at listening to things and just sort of being like yeah I understand yeah yeah instead of being like oh my god that was so bad <laughs> and I think that's any kind of dramatic emotional stuff I think is really stressful to Erin so I think that kind of being on an even keel is part of the, the um but I guess that as well the sense of distance of like having Kate having different background contexts and different cultural contexts is also a space where Erin maybe doesn't have to talk about and explain certain things because they don't just don't come up and maybe it's she wouldn't know to maybe, ask 
Yeah, and maybe it's easier for her to have a relationship on those terms because I think yeah, I think the thing with with Erin is that intimacy is difficult and that kind of like having kind of like big intimate conversations where you reveal a lot of personal information is something that she finds really hard and I think the ideal relationship for her is almost someone who either knows not to do that or doesn't think to ask. (laughs) Right and I mean so you mentioned a couple of times Declan when you were just talking Declan is the friend of Aaron's who so Aaron was in a PhD program, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, tried, I kind of left that kind of vague because um, I sort of like, I guess I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to signpost too much about her. Um, I feel like sometimes I read a book and I get a lot of signposts about whether I'm supposed to think the character is smart or whether I'm supposed to think they're, and I kind of didn't want to signpost her so heavily. And I sort of didn't want to say, oh, she's, she's doing this at this very impressive place because I kind of wanted to leave it more <laughs> what you think of her is what you think of her um but yeah she's dropped out of academia she's doing a, a program master's PhD or something like that and she's dropped out in, of that in London yeah yeah and then she goes back to Belfast after Kate dies and she moves in with her mother with whom she has a terrible relationship um mm. and I guess we should say that the troubles hang over the whole book Mm -hmm. and you don't you don't really have an extended conversation about what they are until like you don't ever have one actually (laughs) but I think you I think you I think you like with many things in the book you kind of get closer to them as you get deeper into it almost as if she's becoming more comfortable with the reader being inside her head or something Mm -hmm. um but that the troubles definitely is heaviest around her relationship with her mother. Declan yeah. never left home, right? He just mm-hmm. so she she and Declan have a shared history and a shared uh, vernacular because both of them know what they're not saying when they're talking to each other, and there's a lot of um, companionship communicated through laughter. It's like, yeah. So is that um, a real thing? Is that like a thing that is? <laughs> yeah, that thing of just like people not certain things people don't talk about. That's like a real thing, and that's something that um, it's something that is quite is interesting, like in a generational sense, and that like those people it's like such a thing to like find out that you had like an aunt that you like didn't never heard of <laughs> but like someone will be like and someone in your family will be like you know your aunt who who like lives in Donegal and you'll be like well, who is that no one's ever mentioned and then they're like you have heard and you're like no I haven't <laughs> you haven't told me and it's like you're sort of supposed to say you're supposed to pretend that you haven't received this information in you that's actually a real a real thing is that getting information told to you as if you already know it even though you don't and you're supposed to just be like oh yeah okay like <laughs> I did I did know that or like it's not this isn't new, new information you're not to me. supposed to be thrown by crazy um, yeah and you're sort of I think there's like a lot of um people not wanting to explain why they have kept a secret or withheld information so they just kind of bring something up and then it's like you just everybody just has to pretend that's like the way it's always um that's and the like, Belfast thing yeah, I think it's a massive, like, it's kind of, well, probably a whole North Ireland thing, but I think okay. that's, a massive, that's a massive thing in just terms of, like, just information is withheld and then, like, relayed to you, and then you're like, when did this, and I guess I think there's a family thing in that, I think the way a lot of people, my parents' generation, brought their kids up was basically, like, trying to kind of almost say as little about the troubles as possible, hmm. just to kind of be like just as a way of trying to and telling bits telling fragmented things and telling bits and pieces of stories but not really telling whole pieces of information when did you Um, find out what it was well so my family's catholic um and I kind of knew I knew a lot so my family's catholic and my mum grew up in Derry um in the bog side of Derry which is like the part of Derry where um, Bloody Sunday happened. Um, so I kind of knew that. I knew that stuff because um, she was there on that day and her dad was quite kind of 
organize or involved with organizing that. So I kind of knew about that stuff and I used to hear stories about that. Um, and I would have known, to be honest, actually, I, I was- you explain what it is for people who don't know? Yes, of course, sorry. Um, Bloody Sunday was a day that um, it was basically, a lot of the troubles kind of started over issues with Catholics being denied housing and access to education and employment. Um, so I think there's like, for a lot of like, during the sort of 60s and 70s, there's probably like, it's like 90% unemployment in Catholics. Um, because there was just like industries like shipbuilding and so on just would only hire Protestants basically um, so there was a real kind of like two-tier society and lots of Catholics didn't own housing because of the employment stuff and they had a voting policy that was you could only vote really if you owned property so lots of Catholics didn't have vote so a lot of the kind of like sort of what led to the troubles happening was protests and kind of um yeah protests and riots and so on against yeah denial of education denial of housing um and denial of yeah I guess by virtue of housing access, access to a vote um so yeah I kind of I kind of knew that context to it in a vague way and then Bloody Sunday was a day whereby they had like organized a march through Derry Derry was basically like the Catholic bit of Derry was like a bit of a slum at that time, I think, um, and that there was sort of just like, you know, it was really, really chaotic. It was kind of badly accessed. It was sort of quite cut off. Um, and there was a, a march basically to like demand, to basically raise awareness and to demand like, yeah, just it was called like one man, one vote and really, really basic stuff. But the British army policed it as if it was a riot and they opened fire and basically shot like 13 men and one other one died in the hospital so it's kind of like that's been a sort of thing that they've recently had a sort of uh, retribution process to basically like accept that as the official version of events but that's really taken like that's taken like like decades and decades to happen so of bloody sunday it was in I don't actually can't remember. Much. It was like seven, seven. It was when my mom was like eleven or something. It was like not. It's taken like a long time to get, get a proper January thirtieth, nineteen seventy-two. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's like it's literally like this. This the past couple of years there has been like proper acknowledgement of what the the official version of events, the one that I just told basically, but the. Um, but yeah, I think that that stuff, like when I was growing up, I kind of knew that side of it. And I kind of knew, which was not the official narrative actually at that time. Um, hmm. And that was kind of, but that was my narrative in a fragmented way and kind of heard that from family stories and stuff. But I, it's interesting that we never, we never learned any of that stuff at school, really. It just really wasn't something we were taught about. In hindsight, I think it's because if there was any kind of mixing in schools, like I actually went to a Protestant grammar school um, and so there's Protestants and Catholics. And I think that in hindsight, it was basically just like, it's quite contentious to have those conversations with children at that time, and teenagers at that time, especially because it was just in the aftermath of it. So yeah, we never really learned it at school. And it's interesting, like now, I like have recently, I've got Protestant friends who I grew up with and I was friends with, you know, when we were teenagers and so on. But we never really spoke about any of that stuff because we just kind of knew not to bring it up. Mm-hmm. And it's been interesting having these conversations now because we all had different versions of what happened. <laughs> and it's kind of like we all That's have like, so yeah, totally. And people have known for like, you know, like almost 20 years, we realized that we have had like, it, we basically are sort of living in alternative realities. But yeah, you would just know to bring not to bring it up. And it's like, I think we can kind of we've talked about it there's two people I can think of who we've talked about it kind of recently and it's been kind of interesting to have those conversations because it's like I sort of think in a way when I was growing up the official version of events was quite kind of biased against Catholics um, and kind of the Catholic version of events but now the Catholic one is the more mainstream one (laughs) in a way so it's kind of weird and that it's sort of like come past like it's kind of changed history sort of changed I guess as um and but yeah no it's 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 a very weird it's a very weird thing to think and it's it's also a thing of like that's kind of what propaganda is in a way like it's you grow up with one version of events and you don't really think about 
what that actually how that links and most people never wikipedia something like that. if you think that something happened a certain way you never actually check um which is normal like we will do that but um but yeah it is it's very it's very very interesting it's such an interesting place to be from because you get all of this weird context into how people think and yeah yeah i mean one of sorry the- that was a rant. <laughs> no, no, I, think it was, I mean it was definitely i'm glad i'm glad for many reasons that we did that but it just makes it makes so many other things about the book that I was going to ask you about charged or tinctured in a certain way. Um, but one of the, one of the things there is this like sense of, of loyalty and honor that Aaron has, although I don't know if she'd use those words and I feel like she'd probably like be annoyed with me if she heard me using those words, but like she gets, <laughs> she, she, she seems to almost feel guilty that she has a trauma that is not the trauma that everybody else has. Like there is this, there is this, there's this thing about being from a community that has a particular narrative and a particular grief that everybody is supposed to be affected by. And everybody is supposed to place on a certain level and sort of above everything else. And then to have, to have another grief that distances you from the community and that you feel in a different way, um, it throws it throws so many things into le- into relief. One of them being that you've never been taught how to deal with grief. So, like, there is this ambient grief that everybody has and that nobody is dealing with, and then there is this very specific grief that you're dealing with that you don't know how to deal with. And um, I mean, I guess that is most obvious in her relationship with her mother. But I wonder if it is something, if it, if it colors the whole book in a way that I hadn't thought about. Yeah, I think she's, um, I think it's, she finds it really hard, I guess, because the way she's being brought up to think of herself as a victim. And I think that's something that her, and so when she has this personal kind of tragedy happen, which is different to what other people are around her are kind of having and dealing with I think when that happens she sort of like doesn't really know how to see herself and how to kind of like relate to herself because she doesn't really have uh and I kind of like there was bits where when she's kind of looking for like her 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 situation like living situation is like quite bad like it's quite precarious in terms of like she's sort of attached to this other one like you know this she's an au pair in a house and um she is quite like not really sort of nailed down how long she can stay there and they don't have a contract or anything it's just like so she's sort of like always kind of half wondering if she'll have to move out um and but she I don't think she really wants to acknowledge like that she's not really in a good situation at all I think it's kind of hard for her to accept that like her situation is quite dire in lots of ways and um, it's not actually like and I think she finds it really hard to think of herself in that way where and I guess it's part partly because like I guess she hasn't really had she's not really someone who has been able to like ask for a lot of help and that kind of stuff and I think it's just being seeing herself as someone who's like hard done by is almost tricky for her because then what follows from that is having to accept that she can't ask anyone for help really and she gets into these like actually quite you know quite strange situations where she's having to like rely practically on strangers quite a lot like she does she does and she always kind of she sort of tells herself that's not really what's going on but like it is you know it's like she's always kind of like oh like this guy I'll just leave my stuff at his and it's like you should, that is kind of a weird thing that you're having to do you know it's like her narrative is always that she's kind of fine and that everything is going to be okay but it's like I think it's kind of hard for her to acknowledge that it's not actually and I think it's almost it's almost kind of reckoning with that accepting her I think accepting the reality of her circumstance is quite hard for her because um she yeah would then have to process a lot more stuff than she's probably willing to process do you think that well let me ask it this way why did Kate's death do this to her yeah I think it's um I think it's almost like it's a sort of out of sorts out of sorts thing and I guess part of it is that um I don't know if she really liked the life that she was living um and I don't know if that really felt authentic to her and 
the word you use loyalty I really like that um and I think authenticity is like a real thing for her as well although I agree that she would probably think that was corny yeah. but um I think that <laughs> that that idea that she I think she's kind of just like what am I doing here and I think sometimes like when you're I think her mode up until that point had sort of just basically been like get getting forward in some way and like I'll just do this and I'll just be working I'll just and I think it's only at that moment that she's sort of like what am I what do I want and where am I actually going yeah. and I think that's kind of it almost triggers those sort of bigger questions and I think um and some of her I think some of her relationship with Belfast was that she was sort of running away in a bit in a way because um her you know her relationship with her mom was quite difficult and she doesn't really have anyone any other family or anything else and so she was almost kind of like I'll just get away from there and I think almost having a link in her kid who's her sort of closest link in the place that she has gone to makes her kind of reevaluate well what is this new place and why did I leave the old place and actually what was I trying to get away from there and and all of that stuff so I think it kind of brings up old questions that have just sort of been buried for her like bad things happen outside of this place also so getting away from that place is really not going to get you away from the bad things okay totally totally. and I think it's almost like kind of this craving of like wanting to kind of go and I think I think she kind of almost goes back wanting to put some things right um and then realizes that I guess her her ability to do that is not you know it it kind of takes that's something I kind of wanted to, to explore a bit in the book I guess is that like most people in relationships just do do not change very much and it's you you kind of go into a situation thinking like I'm going to finally like we're going to have such a like me and my dad are going to sort things out we're going to have such a better relationship and it doesn't actually work that way a lot of the time and actually often what you have to come around to is the realization that a sort of dysfunctional relationship is the one that you're going to get <laughs> and and it's like that's acceptance of that is actually like part of the um and I guess I guess I feel like that's a story that you see less in books and film and so on because um it's quite hard to dramatize in a way um yeah. because it is like you know it's but it is it is a reality that yeah it's like how much to how much does especially like your relationship with your parents like by the time they get to be your parents' age, like they're really sad in their ways. Like they're not, they're not changing. Like, Better like them. Yeah, 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 That's really like, you're not like, you You will never get an apology out of your dad. Like that's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Who gets that? So it's like, I think that, <clears throat> that sense that, I think she almost goes back in this like weirdly quite hopeful f- frame of being like, I'm going to go back and kind of like, all of these loose ends I left, I'm going to tie them all up. And then like, that's just not, not what happens. <laughs> um, okay. I think that her relationship with Jesus is fascinating because I have no relationship with Jesus and don't know what that would be like. Um, but it didn't occur to me until I was listening to you talk before. It's like very obvious in the whole book that Aaron is never she really is very skeptical about the word religion or the concept of religion because she I mean and most concepts like she really does think that people use language in this very imprecise way that she finds incredibly annoying or or really unbearable and so when she, if she's if she's like having a conversation with herself which is where we always are in the book we're always inside her head if she's like Mm -hmm. talking about God, she has to be like, but I don't mean the thing that everybody else means when they say that. I mean, this other thing, (laughs) but I wonder if, um, because of the troubles, religion is always going to mean something other than faith because it's, is that, is that a real thing? That's really, I think that's like, it's, 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 it's more of a tribal thing in that you are, it's more common to identify as a religion and not actually consider yourself religious but something that I have noticed is that like yeah it's, it's definitely it's more co- common to be a Catholic and to kind of not be sort of super bought up but they still people will be like oh I'm Catholic but I'm not religious and not religious that's a normal thing that people say all the time in Belfast but they, they'll still go to mass they'll still they all the time like they'll still go on Christmas 
they'll still go to light the candle. They might, I know Catholic, Catholics who aren't Catholics who will go and like defiantly like not take communion, but I'm like, but you're in. <laughs> but I understand, I understand because, um, yeah, if, I mean, I don't know for myself, like I, I would, if someone, if a friend of mine like has a family member pass away, I'd go to church and light a candle for them as like a mark of respect. And I think like some of those sort of like, I guess the some of the like kind of traditions and rituals that sit around it have sta- stayed and lingered in a way that they don't really they haven't you know it's not really it doesn't exist in England in that way I don't think it exists in America in the same way um, but yeah they've really stayed and lingered because yeah I guess because it's almost I think identifying as a Catholic is easier in Belfast because it weirdly means less like it's just a way of being like oh I grew up on that side of the tracks and I have this surname and like you know my deal <laughs> kind of thing right. so I think, I think it's an easier thing to identify as but I don't think that the identification with it means nothing in the way that people would say or would often say but I also think like I think they kind of everybody kind of understands that and that I don't think that when someone's like I'm Catholic I'm not religious I'm not religious I don't think they actually mean that they're totally not religious it's such an interesting thing that is um yeah I, th- I think about that a lot like I actually I have a Oh, he's dead now, but my grandma's brother was a priest. And even he was always like, No, I'm not religious. And I was like, You're a priest. What did he what did he mean by that? I think he meant, I think he, I think he meant like I'm not in the way that some other priests, like I'm not as religious as some other priests. Well, I guess back then he, you know, it was a way to, if you were like prayer and stuff, it was a way to um go and get do not have university education but like to stay at school like past like 13 um so I think it was like kind of a way to get an education so it was more common to just like to do it as a, a sort of like career <laughs> career progression I suppose but um but yeah he he would have been like oh yeah yeah I'm not I, I'm not like properly religious and I think but then he he would read the bible every day like he would give mass <laughs> I think it's I think people always kind of imagine that there's like another level of religion that exists beyond theirs and they're like oh, I'm not that one <laughs> I think that's yeah, yeah, yeah. is um is she she says I'm not catholic but I am religious right that's what that's what Aaron says yeah. <laughs> and I wonder like is does the context make it difficult for catholicism to mean a relationship with God. Yeah, I, think she, I think she struggles with the um, which I think a lot of Catholics do. It's a it's a weird thing because Catholicism in the North basically it's really, really weird because it basically like it was actually like a marginalized group, which is weird in that it's got like it's all like socialists and stuff like that's what I grew up associating it with which doesn't make sense in any anywhere else in the world but it was like it was like left-wing socialism and like all of this stuff meant that was what Catholic was (laughs) and the the two things were tied together because of the because of the marginalization I suppose but the um but yeah so I think she and I think it's it's weird because actually Catholicism doesn't mean any of those things it's actually quite conservative in a way that is something that I think she finds kind of hard to relate to and I think I think that's true of a lot of a lot of people and so I think she kind of in that you know she has a relationship with God in some way um but she doesn't subscribe to sort of any sort of catholic (laughs) doctrines whatsoever and I think and also you know she's she goes to church a lot in the book but um she never actually goes to mass like she doesn't go with other people um she always goes by herself and I think that's um partly to do with her relationship actually being quite a solitary thing um and it's not something that's kind of ritualized in the way that um yeah it doesn't it doesn't sort of sit within the framework or she tries to keep it separate from I suppose is more accurate to say Mm -hmm. in so for your essay for us for liberties which is also in the group chat um you wrote about you wrote about the death of humor, but the way that we the way that we talked about the essay before you wrote it was that humor plays a very specific role yeah. in Belfast. And I was thinking about that while reading the book because she has she has like no patience for anything that's unserious. And <laughs> like, I mean, that's like a weird way to put it, but like she says at one point she was like, 
thinking, remembering the day that Kate died, she turned off her phone or something so like her phone died. I don't remember, but like she turned it back on or she got it back. And like, she had all of these missed texts that were like, yeah, <laughs> supposed to say, and she says something <laughs> like, they were just trying to like say the right thing, but because people say these things so much, it's so, un- they're all unserious. Yeah. And, like, like, I think she meant, you know, not authentic or not honest or like trite, which is like an, a word I don't think she ever uses in the book, but like, it's the, it would be like a yeah. state thing for her to yeah, say. Right, that, would, that would like be a thing that, yeah, I, I totally agree. <laughs> Yeah, but there is like, I guess, I guess what I'm, what I'm asking about is like the seriousness of humor or like, what is it that humor does that allows you to treat, to like, to like be respectful of the gravity of a certain kind of experience? Yeah, I guess something she hits is like banality and that kind of like recycled, recycled kind of like stock stuff. Like she, I think she really hits that and like I guess like she's quite like antiquated in a lot of ways and that she kind of hits like yeah sort of like memes and you know that kind of like repeated sort of like that way of of speaking where it just doesn't acknowledge what's actually happened yeah I think she kind of hits that and I guess like I guess humor is kind of sort of always has to be surprising and original and I guess that's something that she yeah I think that's something that kind of is um that's something that's sort of like and that sense of because I guess what she weirdly the sense of being able to have a real conversation with something with someone is that you know that's something that and I think with the idea of fakeness is something that she doesn't sit comfortably with you know the idea of like just giving exchanging like these platitudes and condolences that you're supposed to say and she's kind of like what's the actual thing um that you want to say that's, yeah, I think that kind of that slight artifice um, and in gen uh, things being not genuine is something that she kind of like does not sit comfortably with. Um, but yeah, 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 right. Because it would be it just it's disrespectful to the thing that's that's just happened. And I think okay, I wouldn't I wouldn't say or I guess like if I was like trying not to disrespect this book, I wouldn't say that it's like a, a book about trauma because <laughs> so much has been said about trauma books, but I think it is, <laughs> a, that is what it is. And I'm wondering if the reason that, like I was thinking, I've been thinking about this a lot, definitely while reading this book. I think it's true that most of what is said about trauma is it's not frustrating that people are talking about the thing it's that they're talking about it badly totally agree okay and I saw your tweet on that the other day and I was like yeah I totally yeah I think there's like a stock way to talk about that stuff no which is so like um yeah and it's sort of like a stock way. I actually have a piece coming out which refers to this a little bit, but there's a stock way to talk about trauma now, which is like, and a stock way to have a character experience trauma, which is that they have this like big great breakdown and they're kind of like, and it's really legible and they're really sympathetic because they're presented in this really sympathetic way. And I think that's just like not realistic. And it's yeah. sort of like, yeah, and I think it, I feel, I'm sure, I think it, I can imagine why it feels fulfilling to read because it quite straightforwardly makes you feel like a good person. <laughs> like if you're reading I put this quite like a protagonist and you're feeling really bad for all the stuff they've been through and they just make total sense because they've had this terrible thing when they have the breakdown and then it's just, and I think that that's just like not what real people are, are like. And I think the, um, yeah. the and it's, it's weird because I feel like everybody on the one hand, the kind of common knowledge of like therapy concepts seems to have like gone through the roof and the probably maybe language rather than concepts is maybe a better way to say it but everybody's talking about like attachment styles this and like but then yeah. it's, you know that all this stuff exists and that like you know and, and I think Aaron probably has like anxious attachment or whatever it is but they we know right. that stuff exists, but, then, but then it's like the only way to present it is 
only one of them and it's just a really really strange it's a really really strange thing and it's really like um and yeah it's kind of and I can think of some I, I kind of like um oh, I'm not is the name's just gone out of my head um Mia Love Hansen films I kind of yes. love the way that, I was just gonna say that that's yes. so great the way that she deals with the way that she deals with tra- trauma which no one would say that her films deal with trauma but they do they they deal with big things happening but the characters just don't perform in the way that films kind of have made legible and it's like someone will have something really bad happen and it's like they just they don't really it's not the case that they kind of then they have their allotted three months and then it's moves on to the next stage that's just not really how it works and I think her yeah her, her films I feel a huge um sense of like reality and I think it's so smart what she does because she manages to like capture the essence of like people just not people just behaving in real life not in a predictable way like I I love that um what was the what was that one called her film um I'm thinking um, yes yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) um where she is like left by her her husband is a younger woman and it's like it, it's, with her. yeah and it's like it's it's a really terrible thing has happened because it's like her whole life is basically down the drain and then it's like I love that she everything that is sort of she you know she reconnects with this younger student and you kind of in another film that would be her that would be an affair but it's actually just her kind of realizing like how that that's really not something that she wants to be involved with ever again and I love that scene where she is like she's like she goes to visit the young student and is just kind of a bit like freaked out by his lifestyle yeah and then she's lying in bed and she just like is like crying into her pillow and it's not because it's not because of the husband it's because like I almost I almost read that as like like so many of us she has a sort of fantasy life in her head and probably always had like while she was married she kind of part part of her was this young rebel who was like a communist living off grid and then when she goes she's like I actually didn't want that I actually don't want that there's no I've gone and seen the fantasy life and it doesn't exist either and it's like I almost thought that was more devastating because it's almost like when you lose the fantasy it's what else is there to live for <laughs> like right. which is what like, your book is about <laughs> yeah it just doesn't like that was almost the most devastating thing about that film was that the idea that you can't just go and pick up off another thread that you left 20 years ago like that's gone and that's not that's not you know your life has moved on and that's not happening anymore and I thought that was just you know yeah yeah <laughs> sorry okay. I think we have to open it up for questions because I've definitely hogged you for too long so um does anybody have questions for Rachel about her book or about anything else if not then I'll just keep asking questions but <laughs> Rachel this painting is from things to come that's her reading on the subway <laughs> I love that film so much. It's so good. <laughs> Have you read Sheila O'Malley's essay about it? No, I need to read that. I was okay. actually looking for good writing about her, um, about her, and I couldn't really find. I, I couldn't. I was actually struggling to find, you know, kind of good. Yeah, so I'll look that up. Yeah. Okay, I'll send it to you because I'm. I'm. My next essay for Liberties is about Isabel Huppert, so I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> um and. It's so interesting. Have you seen the movie Elle? No. You would love it. Um, it's about it's about well, it's about a woman who is raped and then like does not respond to it the way that we are supposed to. And Sheila O'Malley was she saw like the opening of it at the New York Film Film Festival or something, and all these film critics were furious because they were like you can't like this movie and be a survivor of assault. And Sheila O'Malley was like, that's a really dumb reason to say that a movie is bad. Like what a ridiculous thing to say. So I feel like, I don't know. I feel like your book is doing that in a sense because you really have no patience for, like you even say this at one point, Erin, right after she finds out about Kate says, she like, um, she like lets out this roar that is, and and she's like self-conscious because it's not it's not a feminine way to grieve or something uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's I remember someone so that was some, a friend actually was talking to me about they got some really bad news and 
they they like just roared and sort of screamed but it but it wasn't they didn't say it was a scream and they said they were really embarrassed about it and I remember speaking to them and that that kind of informed that actually because I I do think there's there's such pressure on even you you see that like in a more prosaic way with the way people talk about like ugly crying <laughs> you know when people are like I'm ugly crying or whatever and it's like it's such a strange thing to feel policed in the way that you're you perform emotions like that but I think we, we massively do um and that kind of sense that she is um and I think it's it's weird because I think I think Erin's kind of an interesting one because she's like sort of she's very she's very feminine in some ways like she's very glam you know she's like big makeup girl oh my god like every editor who read that book was like she's always putting on makeup and like fake tan and I was like is she <laughs> it, was like, it was such it was such a case of like you really reveal yourself because I was like oh, is she? <laughs> It's just like, you write a character who's like who's really different to you, but you can't escape from giving them some stuff that you just do. Because I really ha- I hadn't, I didn't think I consciously intended to, um, but it's probably just, it's hard for me to like imagine someone for whom this is not a big part of their life. But she, um, she's very like, <laughs> she's very like fe- feminine in some ways. And I feel like, I kind of feel like the world reads her as quite a feminine, but she doesn't actually feel, I think that she doesn't feel that way. Um, she doesn't feel that way in some in some respects and I think there's that kind of like yeah there's almost like a tension I think between how she feels and how, what she what she appears as to the world which I actually find quite interesting um about her as a character Did you, okay so I guess I'll ask you I'll ask you the question that I was wasn't sure if I was allowed to ask because I feel like it's sort of too obvious um and then I will I will let you go to sleep um because it's I don't know 11 20 there but I was wondering about your writing process. We talked a little bit before people showed up about how you actually went about like literally writing the book. But I was curious, you mentioned on your Substack that you had been living with these characters for a really long time. And I wondered if usually the way that usually when, when a reader is like ingesting a book, the way that they think about it is that the writer is trying to do something with the book and it's, I think that's probably usually not right. I us, I think that it's probably that they're living with these characters, that there's a context that they want to put. There's something something in their mind that is fully formed that they want to get out there and they're not really sure what it means or if it's supposed to mean anything. Um, and I was just wondering, like, how it, what what was it that you were trying to impart? Was it these people? Was it was it that you were struggling with some of these questions and wanted a space to be able to consider them? Um, mm-hmm. Did you know Aaron? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was like, it was those characters and their dynamics between each other was the really interesting thing to me and their, um, their kind of, and actually that idea as well, which only I realized as I was writing it and as I was, going back to really where you read it um the that idea of like how little people actually change and how little you can expect a situation to move on that is really really interesting to me and I think um that's something that I kind of I think it would almost be like it would have it would make more sense I guess as a novel in some ways if there was some great resolution with one of those relationships, like, um, <laughs> but I was I, praying that you wouldn't do that and you didn't. Yeah, thank you. Well, I didn't, I really didn't want to do that. And I didn't, um, and that's not how they looked to me. And I kind of like, I, I hate to spell, I hate spelling stuff out on the page because I kind of want to leave it. Um, and I kind of want to leave it to, but there's stuff like the, um, the some of the dysfunction in those relationships is actually like, and, and I mean, Aaron's relationship with Mikey, who's the kind of, I think that I think they're basically in love. Like they, to me, in, in some ways, they have a great relationship because they sort of understand each other completely. And yeah. to a lot of other people, it doesn't look, it doesn't, it's not a, a good relationship in many ways. But I guess, it, I guess, I'm kind of interested in the idea that the sort of what is functional and dysfunctional is actually like person by person, not necessarily what um, what an Instagram therapy page <laughs> would tell you is functional and dysfunctional. Right. Um, and that's like actually I was talking to um I did an interview with a, a writer who I really like Nicole Flattery whose book I think you would also love but um it's nothing special um which is out, I think it's actually out this week in the states um 
but she yeah she, she's a brilliant writer but she kind of like I, I actually it's funny I read her book and I loved the protagonist like I found the protagonist really funny I like found her refreshing and then all the reviews were like yeah really unlikable protagonist <laughs> and I was like okay but we were kind of talking about that and um it's funny yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's sort of like a but yeah we were kind of talking about that thing of like I do I guess I didn't want Erin to be I didn't want Erin to be like overtly sympathetic um and I guess I, I wanted her to be someone who like I didn't want to make excuses for the way that she acts I didn't want to kind of like explain her in that sort of like she does x because y has happened kind of way and um and yeah i'm, I'm happy with her with how she turned out <laughs> so much okay thank you so much everybody you can you should pre-order the book it's in the chat is in the link is in the chat um and thank you so much for coming and i hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as i did thanks so much Celeste. thank you thank you thank you rachel